Welcome everybody to the Wisdom Gym. And if this is your first time here, this is where we invite some of the world's best teachers to share their techniques, their practices, their perspectives, and sometimes even um, take us through some of those practices here live uh, with members from the Rebel Wisdom community. And I'm really excited today to welcome back Dr. Gaber Mate, who we had on the channel um, a couple of years ago. And is one of my uh, favorite conversations we, we've had. Your work, uh, Gaber, covers um, a lot of different areas. But so one thing that really stands out to me is, is the importance of connection, the importance of real human connection, whether that's in our early life or, or you know, in our lives as adults. We are um, right now in kind of 10 months into a global pandemic, as we all know, in which actually physical connection or even just being near someone has, has been the main thing that we've lost. So I'm really curious to hear, what do you think are the implications of that on our, our health and well-being and, and right now, but also perhaps in the future? A name um, of Stephen Porges might be familiar to you. And uh, Porges is the uh, <clears throat> researcher and developer of polyvagal theory, which I'm not going to go into. But actually in London at a conference that we both spoke at, I heard Stephen make the point that human beings, the human nervous system has a certain expectancy, what he calls neural expectancy. And that's for attuned contact. Now, if you look at how human beings evolved, we didn't evolve in separate apartments and buildings. We've evolved out there in nature, in interaction with nature, but also with one another in small band hunter gatherer groups. And literally for hundreds of thousands of years, and for the most of the existence of our own species, that's how we lived, really connected. Now, modern life has very rapidly torn asunder those ties of connection on multiple levels. And then COVID has absolutely um, divested of the most important human uh, need, which is for contact. And so it, it can't help but have an impact on us. The question is, what kind of an impact will it have? And that depends very much on how we respond to it. I think for some people, it'll have proven to be a major trauma. For other people, it might have been, it might prove to be a major challenge from which they grew and developed and learned. So our response is not automatic and it's not given. It's very much rooted in how we're oriented toward this whole thing. And what that really means is that how life has programmed us up to this point will very much de determine what we'll lose or gain from this experience. And I'm curious about that, that point about um, how life has programmed us up until this point, because you've written a lot about uh, the impact that trauma in our childhoods can have, but to, to I suppose, put it to the positive, what would be some of the, um, you know, the experiences we might've had or could now be having that would increase our resilience in, in this time? Well, if we have learned by now at this stage of our lives, that difficult experiences for all the suffering they may incur are also teachers, we can learn from them then we can grow from this experience. If our childhood programming, which we've never perhaps got over, tells us that the world is a terrible place and we can only expect the worst, then this will simply confirm our ingrained bias and make us even more despondent. So it depends very much on what our childhood experiences were, but also on what we've learned between then and now. Do you think that this will have, though, nevertheless, a long lasting effect on the way that we connect with each other, on our willingness to, to be close? Or, you know, do you think we're just going to kind of forget about it and, and get on with things? And maybe two years from now, this is just kind of all in the past. 
Well, you know, uh, you know that Joni Mitchell song, um, they paved parking lot, put in you know, the paved paradise, put up a parking lot, and she sings, uh, "You don't know what you got, you don't know what you got till it's gone." So you don't know what you've got till it's gone. So I really do think that the connection that you've been asking about, we really come to appreciate it. We might have known it before. You know, I'm just reading. The Idiot by Dostoevsky is my favorite author. And it's a very challenging, incredibly deep novel. But the chief character, the idiot, is this very sensitive, epileptic prince. And not five minutes before we came on, I was reading this passage in which he talks about it. Isn't it amazing that you can look upon a human being and realize that you love him? Isn't that the most beautiful thing? You can look a fellow human being in the eye and know that you love him. Now, of course, he's speaking to a group of jaded upper class Russian aristocrats. They don't know what the heck he's talking about. They think he's an idiot. And right afterwards, he has this epileptic fit. So he's sick to boot. But he's actually talking about reality. He's actually talking about reality. So I think that the beauty of connection has really been driven home to us by the absence of it which goes back to our neural expectancy and our human nature. And what do you make of this, this process we're doing right now in terms of, you know, people going on to Zoom and going on to, to video conferencing and connecting in that way? I know, in fact, Stephen Porges has, has written a, at least one paper on this, you know, looking at it. I mean, it's certainly not the same. But is it an okay substitute? Like, what, what's your experience of it been over the last year or so? Well, it's really quite amazing. I mean, I had a quick look at the location of the various participants who are on this call right now in Japan and United States and Slovenia and I think Poland and I don't know where else, you know? And here we are actually very close up looking into each other's eyes. Oh, that's extraordinary. In some ways, it's probably even more than we would manage perhaps in person. Perhaps in person, this kind of closeness would be embarrassing or a little bit uncomfortable for us. I mean, I could go on for a whole day telling you about the ravages and, um, and um, dysfunctions that technology imposes on us. And I do think it's very harmful in many ways. But again, that has to do with almost any human activity. It's not the activity as such, it's sort of the intention and the process of it that makes the difference. So the same technology, which is so alienating and so addictive and so uh, um, confusing and, and, and pernicious in so many ways. But at the same time, it is allowed for a degree of connection that is unique and which I welcome. Yeah, I wanted to also talk a little bit about uh, addiction because that's uh, an area you are particularly known for. Your work in that area has been very influential. And you mentioned just there, you know, the, the addictive nature of technology. And that's also been something that's come to the forefront recently with, you know, films like The Social Dilemma. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about that and, and you know, what, what your thoughts are about, um, yeah, about the technology we're using and, and its addictive capacity. Sure. So perhaps I'll begin by reiterating my um, um, definition of an addiction, <laughs> which somebody, I think, just posted here on the chat line. So that's good. Thank you. Just. James, you just made it easy for me. So let me give you a definition of addiction and ask all of your participants a question, okay? So addiction is a complex, you know, people say it's a disease, it's a choice. It's not a disease, it's not a choice. I wanna tell you what it really is. So thank you. Uh, my definition has just been posted on the chat line. An addiction is a complex psychological and physiological process, psychophysiological process, I should say, psychological and physiological, that manifests in any behavior that a person enjoys and finds temporary relief in and therefore craves 
and finds relief in, but suffers negative consequences in the long term and doesn't give up despite negative consequences. So pleasure, relief in the short term, therefore craving, negative effects in the long term, inability or refusal to give it up despite negative consequences. That's what an addiction is. Now, notice that I said nothing about drugs. It could be about drugs. Caffeine, nicotine, heroin, crystal meth, whatever. It could also be about gambling, gaming, the internet, technology. Could be about uh, pornography, sex, eating, shopping, work, self-harm, extreme sports, anything. The issue is not what you're doing, the issue is your relationship to it. You can work consciously, or you can work addictively. You can exercise consciously, or you can exercise addictively. You can eat consciously, or you can exercise, or you can eat uh, addictively. You can even use drugs consciously, or you can use drugs addictively. The question is, craving relief in the short term, negative consequences, etc. So the question I'm going to ask all your participants now is to consider, according to my definition, have you ever had an addictive process in your life? Just raise your hand, either openly or silently to yourself if you have, okay? All right. Uh, <laughs> if there's no, if there's somebody with no hands, with the hands not up, there are two possibilities, either you're a saint or you're a liar. It's one of those two. Now, and if you're a saint, I want to know how you did it. Now, um, by the way, saints often used to be addicts, like St. Augustine, for example. But the question I'm going to ask you next, and you might want to put this on the chat line, is not what was wrong with the addiction for what, or what Hamid did. I'm not even asking what you were addicted to. I don't care. But what did you like about it? What did it do for you? Just put it in the chat line. Did you, what did you get from it in the short term? Just... Somebody says a gateway to spiritual growth, okay? Uh, escape, oblivion, calm, relief, stability, excitement, a nice buzz, made me forget for a while, okay? Control, freedom, pleasure, okay? Aspiration, numbing, thank you. Well, I'll stop here. Why do people, self-esteem, somebody says, why do people need to escape when they're prisoners? When do people need relief? When they're in pain? When, when do people need relief from anxiety? When they lack inner peace? When do they need a sense of control? When they have no sense of agency in their life? When do people feel numbing? It's when you go to the dentist and it hurts and they numb you. It's when you have pain. So my mantra is, as I outlined in my book, in the realm of hungry ghosts, is not the question is not why the addiction, but why the pain. And so, really, what you're telling me, all of you, and what everybody always tells me, is the addiction was not your primary problem. Your addiction was your attempt to solve a problem, the problem of human pain, and that has to do with your childhood and your life experience. Now, when it comes to internet addiction, for example. We think all these addictions are different. There's heroin here and crystal meth over there and gambling over here and pornography over there and internet over there. No, there isn't. There's a universal addiction process that employs the same brain circuits, no matter what the addiction is. And so in, in a brain scan of gaming addicts, internet gaming addicts, they find the same circuits to be disturbed as would be disturbed in a cocaine addict. And the cell phone companies and the gaming companies, they know very well, they consciously create their machinery to appeal to the parts of your brain that are most susceptible to addictive uh, transformation. So this isn't even accidental. It's a result of a conscious decision, which is profit driven. And then when there's some emptiness in you, some emotional pain, some distress, what do you do? Where well, you might have a drink, you might shoot cocaine, or you might veg out on the internet. 
certainly I'm prone to that. And because it's so difficult for human beings to face their pain, to face their distress. So addiction is a major form of escape, including the technology. And all the more so since in our modern world, I'm talking before COVID, human connections have really been frayed. And the internet promises connection. I mean, what do you have on Facebook? You have friends, right? Friends. But they're not really friends because they don't know who the heck you are. And you don't show them who you are. You show them your best face. It's called Facebook. And people like you. No, they don't like you. They like what you present them with. They don't even know you. So it's highly addictive. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for that. And, you know, something, uh, a question came up in me as you were speaking, um, something I'm really curious about now, which is the link between uh, the, the search for release or the search for filling a void that we go through with addiction and spiritual questing. I think someone in the chat, one of the first things that came up was kind of, you know, uh, related to that. And I, I've heard, and I can't remember where it was, but it was a, a saying of the, that the, the heroin addict and the Zen master are looking for the same thing, this, this kind of, this nothingness. Um, I'm cu curious to hear your thoughts about that, about the, the, the kind of maybe counterintuitive or strange link between spiritual questing and, uh, yeah, and filling a void through addictive behavior. Well, yeah, that's a complex question. And, and, and spiritual questing is like everything else. It's not the outer behavior as such, but your internal relationship to it that tells you whether it's addictive or not. So if I'm on this constant spiritual quest because I'm convinced that I'm deficient, I need to be something different than what I am. Then I'm simply feeding my pain. And the spiritual quest never leads to real spiritual realization because that has to actually have to do with the capacity to be with the void, not to escape it. So in a genuine um, spiritual quest, we are committed to experiencing whatever arises. And if that void arises for us, that emptiness, the, even that terrifying sense of inner deficiency, in the Zen tradition or any spiritual tradition, you're able to be with it and see what comes on the other side of it, not knowing that anything will. Whereas the addictive drive is immediately to fill the void. Okay, I'm going to take on another spiritual path. I'll go on another retreat. I'll do another ceremony. But I can't be with whatever is there. By the way, uh, just clarify here. I don't present myself as a shining example of somebody who can be with that void, my mind very quickly goes to trying to fill it. You know, I do, um, currently I'm doing a, a daily yoga practice twice a day. Just very recently I started again. And you say Om oh, 21 times. You know, I can't even count to 21 before my mind goes somewhere else. So my mind is very much programmed to fill it in, fill it on its thoughts and ideas and images and memories and plans and hopes and fears. I'm just very much programmed that way. I just happen to know that that void, if it does arise, needs to be, needs to be stayed with. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And on the subject of, yeah, spiritual processes, I want to um, he hear a little bit about the, the process you've developed more recently, Compassionate Inquiry, and then open up to, to everyone who's gathered here to um, 
for kind of a, a Q and A, but there's also an opportunity to um, perhaps bring bring something that that you are um, you, you want to kind of maybe work on a little bit and get a, get a sense of how compassionate inquiry works. So finally, Gabor, from me, I just wanted to hear uh, to segue into that. Yeah, what what is compassionate inquiry, and how did it come about? Well, um, Alex, it's not quite as recent as you have indicated. So, how should I put this quickly? When I was in family practice, at a certain point, I realized, I really realized that people's illnesses, whether it was mental distress, like addiction, anxiety, or depression, or physical illnesses like autoimmune diseases, cancer, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, endometriosis, I don't care what, in virtually every case had to do with the mind-body unity that it had to do with that in, that an important important facet of it was the relationship of emotions to our nervous systems and our immune system and our hormonal apparatus and so on so you know i can give you any number of examples you know women with ptsd have doubled the risk of ovarian cancer Women who were abused in children have an increased risk of endometriosis. Men who had were sexually abused as children had three times the risk of heart attacks. I could go on and on and on and on. But that meant that in approaching people's illnesses, you had to deal not just with the physical, biological realities of their process, but also with their emotional, mental histories and lifelong relationship to themselves because these were deeply implicated in the onset of their illness. But the question was, then what do I do? Once I get that realization, then what do I do? Well, I can't send them to psychiatrists because psychiatrists don't know a thing about this. For the most part, they're trained in seeing mental illness as a biological disease of the brain. Here is a pill. Not all of them, but many of them. <laughs> The, the medical specialists like, um, like um, neurologists and, 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 and gastroenterologists and so on. Well, let me ask you, your audience, this question. Again, raise your hand, okay? How many of you in the last five years, say, have been to any kind of a neurologist, gastroenterologist, rheumatologist, uh, dermatologist, cardiologist, immunologist, rheumatologist, any kind of onologist, just put your hand up, okay? Right. Now, did they ask you about your childhood trauma? Did they ask you about your pers present relationship to your spouse or partner or friends? Did they ask you how you feel about your work? Did they ask you about how you see yourself? Did they ask you about how you deal with your emotions? Any of that stuff all of which pertains to the condition that took you to them in the first place. But they're not trained to understand that. There's a whole science of it, but it's not introduced in the medical cur curricula. So then, Michael, what do I do? So I started counseling patients myself. I, b I bumbled into it. And I bumbled into it also because I had to deal with my own depression, my own ADHD, and the fact that my own marriage was in difficulty. And that <clears throat> there I was a successful doctor and a really unhappy human being. So I had to look under all this stuff. It exists in a number of different forms, but the long and short of it is that it's just this method that I developed and it's called compassion and inquiry for two reasons. One is it makes the assumption that there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with anybody, not with who they really are. Something happened to people and what happened made them adapt certain defenses like addiction and those defenses of course they've created more problems but they're not wrong to have developed those defenses it's the only thing they could have done as kids so, so in other words to be compassionate towards yourself and towards every aspect of yourself the inquiry has to do with how we ask questions and we ask questions to help people realize what's underneath their so-called dysfunctions that in a nutshell is compassion inquiry. And I'm, so now if you want to put questions to me about it, I'm happy to take them. 
I'm also happy to work with people if anybody wants that online here. If there's any problem you want me to work with you, if you're open enough to doing so online in front of 82 strangers from all over the world, why not? You know, but but that depends on the individual. So uh, um, I can work with this any old way you want. We can start with your questions, perhaps, if you like. But if somebody really would like the work and we can demonstrate it, then, of course, they can be a teacher to the rest of the group. Mike Stroh, you have um, raised your hand, so to speak. So go ahead. Sure, thank you. Uh, Mike, hi. Thanks for doing this. Can I say a few yeah. things? Ground rules, okay? So first of all, uh, thank you for doing this. Secondly, you'll find me interrupting you okay, at times. If I do yeah. so, it's because I think it's helpful to do that. It's not because I'm impatient or I'm bored or, I'm, or, or I think you're wrong, okay? None of that. It's just I'm going to move the process along for your benefit, okay? Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, any question I ask you is an invitation, not a demand. So if I ask you something and you don't feel like answering it, even if, if mid into your answer, midway into your answer, you realize I'm not comfortable talking about this, you just stop, you just say so, okay? But until you do say so, I'm gonna assume that it's okay with you. Is that fair enough? And the final, the final thing I'll say is, I don't know what problem you're gonna present me with, but I really have no idea whether I can help you at all. It's an experiment, right? As long as you're willing to be part of an experiment, I am, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll come out of it looking totally incompetent. I don't know. Let's give it a chance. <laughs> okay. So, what would you like to talk about? Sure. Um, I guess just to preface what you were saying, I've this is a bit of an indulgement for me because I have done a lot of these type of things, but it's I always love doing them again. Uh, or more. And specifically, I read Stop recently, right listened to. Oh, sorry. Stop right there. Please. Yeah. One of the things I do in Compassion Inquiry is I pay attention to people's language, okay? Now, if I was working with Melissa or David or Alexander or anybody else, would you say to them, or oh, you indulging yourself? No. But notice you said it to yourself. Yes. Which means that there's an element of lack of compassion for the self. Notice that? Yes. Even as you're asking your help for help, you're kind of excusing yourself. Okay? I'm kind of what? Sorry? Excusing yourself or... or, or yes, or, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Well, let's just notice that. Nothing wrong with that. I'm, this is not to make you wrong. It's just an automatic tendency that you might notice in yourself. Okay? All right. Definitely. Fair enough. Thank you. Please carry on. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm never, no matter how much help I get, I'm still not worthy of getting it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I read or I listened to The Scattered Mind recently. And the tiny backstory is I was chronic addict from about 12 to 30, got married, sobered up, had a kid. And as you know, marriages when with one person in recovery tend to be difficult. And so it was pretty difficult for the first five years or so. We have two kids, one of which, and I have a diagnosis of ADHD. Um, I guess it's been almost 10 years since I've been sober, et cetera. But my son has ADHD. And he's eight. And so where I struggle, and I've done the mindful self-compassion, a lot of that training, is still like a lot of what you said in that book was so relevant in terms of the my own childhood, my wife's childhood, um, and the stress in our home for my son and daughter. That has diminished quite a lot over the past five years or so, but there's still remnants of it. And also, obviously, the first five years of his life were pretty stressful. So I have shame associated to that. I 
I get into my own catastrophizing of like, oh, I didn't do this. And every time he acts a certain way and I respond with anger or impatience, the catastrophizing goes. And so I think part of it's like self-forgiveness slash being as responsible and attuned to him. Because I think you use that word a lot, attunement. Um, and so we have, as a family, we've certainly healed and we continue to practice, but yeah, I, I just, that's a gnawing angst inside and uh, there's shame there for sure. Yeah. I got it. And, uh, as a parent, I, as you know, from that book, I, I went to the same yeah. thing. And, uh, even long after I wrote that book, I continued to carry guilt and self blame about what I the experiences that my children had in a home with two very stressed parents, sometimes at each other's throats and sometimes not talking to each other at all. Yeah. So I get that. Um, one of my sons and, and I, his name is Daniel, him and I are actually going to write a book together called Hello Again, A Fresh Start for Adult Children and Their Parents. And uh, that's after we finish this current book. And you might want to look at YouTube and look us up in this talk that we give together on on that topic. Now, I know your kids are not adults yet, but you just might get something out of it. Okay? Yeah. What's it called? Sorry? Hello again. Just, just, just Google Daniel and Gabor Mate. That's all. On YouTube. You'll find it. It's been seen by about 300,000 people. Now, going back to your shame and guilt. So, let's agree on something. Had you not had been addicted, had you not been going through a difficult recovery, had you and, you, you and your wife had not had significant deep stresses that went back to your childhood and to hers, otherwise she wouldn't have been with you. So it's not just about you, by the way. Yes, totally. Yeah. <laughs> but had that not had happened, your children would have an easier time in life. Let's agree on that, okay? Let's also agree that had all that stuff not happened, they wouldn't be facing some of the difficulties that they're facing right now. That's true, right? Absolutely, yeah. 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 So that is true. How do we separate that from the guilt, though? So let me ask you this question. How, at what day, I'm going to ask you a number of questions, okay? Inquiry. The first question is, do you remember the date and the time of the day when you woke up and you decided, I'm going to screw up my kids? No. You can't remember that date? You have bad memory? What? No, I don't have. I definitely have a bad memory. <laughs> it's been fried <laughs> to shit. But, <laughs> but you're pretty sure that didn't, that didn't happen, right? Definitely not. So you never consciously made a decision, did you? I'm going to screw my kids up. No. I'm going to impose on my kids some of the traumas that I experienced. You didn't make that decision, did you? Well, no, but I have to be honest. There are moments when I have the thought, I want to make this person suffer because of my anger or something like that. I get you know? that. I get yeah, that. Yeah, okay. I yeah. get that. But in terms of a decision to create problems for your kids. No, definitely yeah. not. Number one. Number two. How old were you as a child when your parents decided to work on themselves and to work out their traumas so they wouldn't keep passing it on to you? How old were you when that happened? Still has yet to happen. Okay. But it's happened for your kids, right? Can you realize what a gift you're giving them? Can you realize how wonderful it is for them that they have parents who are seeking to become or who are becoming conscious. So when you catastrophize, all you're doing is you're projecting your own childhood onto your kids. For sure. But you're, not, but you're not factoring in that they have different parents. You see that? I do. Can you acknowledge yourself for that? Yes. I can't always feel it, but I can sometimes. I'm not asking you to feel anything. I'm just asking. Can you acknowledge yourself? With it? Yes. Okay, good. Now I'm going to come to my third question. 
When in your life have you not felt guilty, Mike? <laughs> um, maybe in long bouts of meditation, but uh, or maybe when I'm in the service of others. But generally speaking, it's there. No, I'm going to make a wild guess here. The guilt was yours before you had kids. Yes. It has nothing to do with your kids. <laughs> uh, true enough, when we have children and we let them down in some ways, some remorse is inevitable. But yeah. that deep sense of guilt about yourself, you had that long before you even looked at your wife. Never mind your kids, right? Yeah, I mean, that's part of being an addict, no doubt, is, is no, that. No, it's not part of being an addict. It's part of being a traumatized child. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you are guilty because you didn't make you happy, right? Didn't make my parents happy? You told them happy. Sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. No, no you have some guilt because you didn't make your kids as happy as you could have. Ah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. No, you already answered my question. But who are the first? <laughs> who are the first people you didn't make happy? My mom, primarily. But yeah, that's where your guilt comes from. Because kids take that on themselves. So taking that on, the spiritual teacher says that the biggest gift we can give our children is our own happiness. So you keep working on that. Your kids are going to be just fine. Now, your guilt has nothing to do with your kids. There's some healthy remorse about your kids. That's it. Yeah. But that's not true. No. Um, so your guilt predates your children. So whenever you notice that guilt, but guilt, once it, once it becomes ingrained, it'll use anything as further evidence. <laughs> yes. So all your guilt that you've had all your life is doing, that has to do with, nothing to do with what you ever did wrong. It's, it has to do with an impossible task that you were given as a kid to make your mother happy. It was totally impossible. It should never have been your job. But you were given that job and you took it on because you couldn't help it. And you failed at it. And hence the guilt. And that guilt will now use anything as further evidence to justify its existence. still can't do it <laughs> i don't try anymore i still can't make her happy i don't try anymore but yeah, yeah. well i just yeah. noticed that the the feeling of guilt like when you as a final question and i'll let you go yeah sure um, as a final question when you feel the guilt where in your body do you feel it where does it show 100 percent. it's like here for sure okay and sometimes a little bit up here Okay, now allow yourself to feel into it a little bit now. Is that possible? Just, yeah. Just let it be there. And ask yourself this question. How familiar is that feeling to you? And how far does it go back? How familiar it is and how far does it go back and what what answer might come up for you about that part of the answer is it's like the main thing i am familiar with and i don't know how far back it goes but i'm sure it goes pretty far back if i sat with it long enough i'd probably get some clear images and memories yeah I don't mean any specific incident, but can you agree that it goes back before you had children? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Next time it arises, do your kids a favor. Don't make it about them. <laughs> don't make it about them. Okay? They don't want to be the effects of your guilt. No, they do not. Nor do I want them to be the receivers of it. Yeah. Fair enough for now? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And thanks for the 
Rebel Wisdom crew for bringing you here. This is amazing. Thanks. There were uh, a couple of questions that were quite popular in the chat. Um, I'm going to start with Josh, uh, Josh Yuri. Yeah, the, qu the question was, I'm just curious as to your thoughts on how to effectively work with collective trauma. Well, tell me what you define as collective trauma. Well, some of the things you were mentioning, you know, these these displacement experiences and, um, yeah, the, the ways in which the modern world are um, not, they don't, it doesn't feel natural. Like we don't, maybe we we're not conscious of it, but um, yeah, just, I guess, so each of us experiences trauma individually and there are ways and therapies and methods for, for dealing with that. Um, I'm not familiar. I think Thomas Hubel I've, um, has done a fair amount of work in this area, but um, yeah, I was just curious as to your thoughts on, are there effective modalities that you're aware of or, um, you know, for, for working with those kind of things? Yeah. So take something like, well, take any trauma, you know, that is suffered by a people or a society. It'll have its personal aspects, but also it's also collective, like the the displacement and um, torment of indigenous people in Canada is a collective trauma that was endured by that whole population. So in Canada, 30% of the population, sorry, 4% of the Canadian population is indigenous, First Nations. But 30% of the jail population is indigenous. When I worked in addiction in Vancouver, downtown east side, 30% of my clients were First Nations. Why? Because of the collective trauma that they had endured. The ra and the racism they continue to endure. It's ongoing in multiple levels. So how to work with that? Well, first of all, we need to work it on the social level. I mean, we just need whatever leverage or platform we have, we have to call for the society that continues to perpetrate those traumas, to recognize that it is perpetrating traumas and to own it and to take responsibility for it. Um, they did have to take the death of George Floyd for many Americans to realize that there's police violence against uh, black people. Did it take that tragedy? It seemed that it did. And we'll see in the long term how deeply that lesson was actually absorbed, or will it just become a memory very soon? So we have to work on it on the social, economic, political levels, that's for sure. In terms of healing, it really helps to do group work, like Thomas Hubel does, for example. Um, because one of the deepest wounds that trauma imposes is the belief that it's it's all your fault or it's all ju just you that it's only me so when we do group work there's such relief to recognize that no it's not me this is a human experience which i share with other people not only that the group work as whatever you think of 12 step groups but one of the things that's good about them when they work is that the group energy is higher than that of the energy of any one individual. The people with higher consciousness in a group can pull up the others. So, yes, collective trauma best be, although it, it needs, the individual impact needs to be addressed individually, but at the same time, it does involve social and political, economic and group uh, approaches as well. In my view. No, thank you. Uh, thanks, Josh. And next up is Jessica. Well, hi, Gabor. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for making the Compassion Inquiry training programs available. It, I have taken the self-study one and it's made a huge difference in my life. So I, I greatly appreciate that and you being here. Um, and 
I don't know if it was in the videos that I watched in that program or elsewhere, but I remember seeing an interview where uh, you mentioned that you would love to debate Jordan Peterson on the topic of hierarchies. And ever since I saw that conversation, I've wondered like what your thoughts are about how we can organize ourselves and human beings could sort of um, arrange ourselves in ways that might create less trauma with the, our ways of being in the world. Yeah. Well, I think um, Peterson takes a very primitive view of hierarchy. Like he talks about lobsters and how lobsters, they have higher serotonin levels when they're dominant. Well, yeah, okay. Something good about hierarchy. And, 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 but, but mostly it seems to take, I don't want to misrepresent him, but my understanding is that he seems to take a point of view that hierarchies are merited, that, that if you're at the top, it's because you belong there. Well, there's nothing that tells me that in capitalist society, the people at the top belong there. There's nothing at the top that tells me that people who exploit others and are willing to destroy the universe and, 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 the, and, the, and the planet and have people die of illness that could be prevented for the sake of profit people that will create and sell addictive drugs, people that create and sell addictive foods and therefore become billionaires. There's nothing that tells me that these people have any kind of a merit that puts them at the top. So real hierarchy is about eldership. All societies used to have elders. But in the hunter-gatherer societies, the others didn't become elders simply because they were older. They became an elder because they were committed to the welfare of the whole group and they had wisdom. So what if we, in fact, I'm just reading a book called Coming of Age by Stephen Jenkinson, who's a Canadian um, farmer, philosopher, healer, palliative worker, um, spiritual thinker. And he's talking about what's missing in our society is eldership. We talk about the elderly, but we no longer talk about elders. So there's a kind of natural hierarchy that comes because you've earned my trust and you've demonstrated your wisdom. And I want to listen to you and learn from you because I know that you're for me. That's a natural hierarchy. A natural hierarchy is based on power and wealth. And that has nothing to do with merit. It has to do with what family you were born into or how cunning you were at the expense of everybody else. Wonderful. Thank you for that question and the answer. And I'm glad you mentioned Stephen Jenkinson, who we had on the channel in um, May, who I was really struck by as, as uh, yeah, uh, fantastic, a very wise man. And Next question is from Mel Tao. Hello. Hi, um, Gabe. It's really wonderful to, to have you on the call. I'm a big fan of your work um, and has helped me to no end during my life, so I appreciate that. Um, the question that I have is situated around inquiry. Um, so you sort of mentioned before when you spoke about the psychiatrists and the neurologists that they leave inquiry out of their their consultation or their approach. And so the first part of my question is, why do you think that area of care has left inquiry out of their approach? And then the second part of that is, what is it about inquiry, um, in your opinion, that creates such a difference in outcome? Well, so first of all, um, they do it in inquiry, but it's a very narrow inquiry that's limited to the biological um, uh, domain. And it doesn't recognize the unity of the mind-body uh, oneness so the inquiry is there's an inquiry there but it's very limited well i could talk for a whole day about why that is so but let me tell you one interesting fact <laughs> some of you might know what telomeres are t-e-l-e-m-o-r-e-s telomeres are made up of dna but they're not genes they sit at the ends of chromosomes and like glue at the end of a shoelace, they function to keep the shoelace or the chromosome from unraveling. And when we're born, we have a 
they're about 10,000 units long. And when we die, they're about 4,000 units long. So as we age and as we get stressed, our telomeres get shorter. And as they get shorter, we're more prone for disease and inflammation and eventually death. So they measure our biological age rather than our chronological age. For example, they looked at the telomeres of women who are chronic caregivers to sick children. Their telomeres are 10 years shorter than their, biology, than their chronological counterparts. They also looked at the telomeres of medical students. In one year, they shorten much faster than that of other young people their age. In other words, the medical profession is a brutal profession to train in. And people have to really shut themselves down to survive it very often. And nothing in their training, like th there's literally on my computer, I'm writing a new book. It'll be published next year. It'll be entitled, The Myth of Normal, Illness and Health in an Insane Culture. I think my telomeres have been shortened by working on this book. <laughs> it's been a heck of a process. But in preparation for this book, I looked at thousands and thousands and tons of scientific studies. I mean, major medical journals, major scientific journals. They're not at all controversial. Published on the mind-body unity and how emotions and stress affect the body. None of that information enters the medical schools. So these doctors have no idea. They literally have no idea. And personally, they're not comfortable with it because they're so stress-driven themselves. So that's my quick answer. Your second question, Melissa, had to do with what was it had to do with inquiry again, but I forget what the question was. Yeah, it was just following that up with um, why you think inquiry has such powerful or different outcomes. So, well, it doesn't. You... Well, it doesn't necessarily. It depends who does it and why. Um, for example, let's say you came to me and you told me that you did something that you're not particularly proud about. Just put your mic on for a second, because I want to ask you yep. something. Okay. So if they said to you, why did you do that? Do you think you would tell me? Uh, I, I mean, probably not. I would probably say, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think that Sorry. would put you in a defensive mode, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, it would put me in a defensive mode. Yeah, but what if I said to you, hey, Melissa, um, why do you think you did that? So it's not just the inquiry, it's a compassionate inquiry. Uh, as one of my teachers, A.H. Almas says, only when compassion is present are people willing to look at the truth, to see the truth. Now, people want the truth. There's something in your nature that wants the truth. As much as we fight against truth and we tooth and nail resisted at times, I have, but something in me wants the truth, something in you wants the truth. So that's where the inquiry comes in, as long as it's in a context of compassion. Then it can when you say, com oh, sorry, sorry. Um, when you say compassion, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask another question, Ali, <laughs> when you say compassion, um, what can you define that just from your perspective? Compassion is that I'm going to accept you exactly the way you are. I'm not going to judge you in any way. That I see the greatness in you. And uh, I'm just interested in finding out what happened to you and how you see things. All of that together. But fundamentally, you get that I'm for you. I'm absolutely committed that you find your own truth. And in no way will that be used against you. You know, when a policeman warns you that anything you say could be used against you, well, in compassion inquiry, nothing that you say can be used against you. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah.
Gabor Mate, thank you very much for, for joining us here uh, at the Wisdom Gym. It was uh, yeah, a real pleasure and a really, really beautiful session. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. You too. And uh, everyone would like to give a, a silent goodbye and, and maybe uh, put your thank put your you, Gabor. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.